there. <laughs> um, my name is Li Ping Vong, and I'm a junior in graphic design. And I was one of the students who went to Encore last May. Um, today, I'd like to introduce to you the keynote speaker for iScore, Ariel Lucky. Um, Ariel Lucky is a hip-hop theater artist whose community and performance work dances in the crossroads of education, art, and activism. Articulate, insightful, and passionate, Lucky seamlessly weaves storytelling, spoken word poetry, dancing, acting, hip-hop, acting and hip-hop music, and compelling narratives of personal and political transformation. Lucky's lyrical language and political vision have inspired and transformed audiences from the streets of Seattle's WTO demonstration to Cafe Cantante in Havana, Cuba, to the New York Poets Cafe in New York City. He has been a featured artist at the North Bay Hip Hop Theater Festival, La Pena Cultural Center's Echo and Califas Festival, the White Privilege Conference, and the Intersection for Arts Hybrid Project, and has performed at theaters, conferences, community centers, and classrooms across the country. Please help, help me in welcoming Ariel Lucky. It was written, spoken, and screamed, open in dreams of vision, provoking a stream of consciousness transition. This intuition to listen. We must make sacred decisions to listen. We must break hatred's divisions to listen. To our elders weave in wisdom. Listen to the lyric of our love and freedom song. Listen to the voices that will carry freedom on. A new day, a new dawn found on the horizon. Now with the uprising, harmonizing, organizing, to keep surviving. To have arrived in time to redesign the instrumental. I say a prayer to stay aware of the potential. Freedom is essential. Within our discipline, the listening is influential. Because we can learn to live with alternative perspective. Connected by a light that burns to be reflected, directed to where our paths intersected, collective because our life is respected. Can it be our family will be united, guided to a place to overcome the ways we've been divided? As we were born, it was meant to be, as my name was sent to me, intent to be a new identity, a lion of spirit. Now I'm trying to hear it. Sometimes I fear it becomes too much when I feel the true touch. It's a double-bladed sword. I can't afford to not be clear. I've got to steer my vessel toward the light that got me here. Following the stars as a guide to the universe, you can't assume the worst when creating something better. Every sentence in the letters and the letters in the sentence brings the meaning together. Every seed in the land understands the plan. We dig our hands in the earth, manifest the birth. To see what kind of harvest our future is yielding, as we start building a world for our children. As we start building a world for our children. What's up, Iowa State? How you feeling? <laughs> All right. It's great to be here. My name is Ariel Lucky. And um, yeah, we're going to spend a little time together. Is that OK with you? All right, it's going to be a little interactive. So um, just so you know, this, this, uh, this wall is coming crumbling down, right? So um, I was telling my family that I was coming out to an iScore conference, and they were kind of like, since when have you started doing athletic programs? <laughs> I was like, well, <laughs> I explained to them what it was, and, th and they were all very excited. But no, this is actually my first time in Iowa. Um, yeah, what's up, Iowa? <laughs> I appreciate you guys organizing the weather for me. It's, it's very nice. I, I appreciate that. Um, yeah, it was good. I'm from California, Oakland, California. Anybody been out to Oakland? Yeah, that's a, that's a good number of people. <laughs> well, next time you're out there, come and, and, and look me up. So um, I want to explore a couple questions with you all this afternoon. Um, questions like, how does the history of this country, of this place, affect who we are and how we relate to each other. 
looking at relationships between peoples within our community and also between us and the land that we live on, right? These are kind of questions that I get very excited about. And I want to share with you some more questions and different kind of ways to think about it this afternoon. But because I'm an artist, I'm not going to just be talking about it. Um, I want to share some of my creative work as a vehicle to explore and have this conversation. Does that make sense? Let's try it again. Does that make sense? Yeah. All right. Now I know you're with me. Now I know you're with me. So I'm going to be sharing um, a couple different excerpts from my one-man show. Can anybody guess what the name of the one-man show is? <laughs> okay, yeah, so I'm just playing. It's Freeland, um, and it's a 90-minute hip-hop theater piece. Anybody know anything about hip-hop theater? <laughs> All right. <laughs> What's up, two of you? That's great. Uh, <laughs> I know you know something about hip-hop, though, right? Yeah, right? Okay. So um, just very, 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 very briefly, hip-hop came out of the late 70s, out of a city they refer to as New York, <laughs> right? The Bronx, right? Specifically South South Bronx. Um, came out of working class communities of color, primarily Caribbean immigrants and African American folks um, in the late 70s. They had cut all the social services. Uh, there were no music programs, no creative programs for young people. And so they started creating their own um, work, right? This is 30 plus years ago now, so there's a long history, right? Coming from that very specific community and then growing and then growing and then growing from, to, you know, you got like um, Will Smith all the way up today to like Jay-Z, et cetera, et cetera. It's a long story. I think there was a workshop this morning, so you all know about it. Um, but hip-hop theater in particular started coming around about 10 years ago. And what that was was um, young artists, theater artists, actors, MCs, et cetera, they started taking some of the elements of hip-hop. People talk about breakdancing, DJing, um, MCing, and graffiti art, right? So they were taking some of those elements and using them in their theatrical presentations, um, their plays and their monologues, et cetera, et cetera. Um, one other definition that I've heard people use is that it's theater. Hip-hop theater is theater made for, by, and about the hip-hop generation, right? Which is some of us in this room. But it's for everyone to appreciate and enjoy. So I'm going to share uh, an excerpt of my show. It's 90 minutes long, so we don't have time for the whole thing. I'm going to share a couple different pieces with you um, to get the conversation started, and then we'll go from there. Does that sound good? Y'all with me? Okay, I like it. I like it. Let's see if this works. It works. Beautiful. <laughs> give thanks to tech people, and, um, and let's give love to the lunch people, taking us up. What a gift to be fed, right? Working hard at this conference, we've got to sustain ourselves. So this is an excerpt of Free Land, and it goes a little something like this. <sighs> I'm just a white boy, attracted to the color, disconnected from my roots, so I reach for another's. I'm discovering power and beauty in Lakota culture, like the sacred eagle. But I feel like a vulture, dancing on their graves and singing their songs. I just want a community where I belong. And there's something here that I feel in my core, but I can't really call it. Haven't felt it before. Wasn't present in my synagogue or in the church, maybe. It's what I've been looking for on my search, a spirit and energy, connection to the land, but why don't my people have it? I try to understand. My family sold our culture for American whiteness, assimilated to make it suppressing what was inside us, changed our names and our language, even our religion. In exchange for the privileges white people are given. But the cost of what was lost cannot stay hidden. And now I hunger for spirituality and tradition and I listen to the songs, and I want to sing along 
but there's something missing. It feels all wrong. I'm standing in a room filled with empty picture frames, and I don't know the languages, the stories, or the names. I can't see my own reflection. Nothing is clear. Who am I? What am I doing here? Where do I come from? And what does it mean? Is this what they wanted in the American dream? I need to color in the blank white faces. Fill the void with memories, dates, and places. I'm lost without this knowledge of self. I'm sick and tired of trying to be like everybody else. If you don't have roots, then how can you grow? I'm going to dig for the truth. Fuck it, I need to know. I go to my grandfather, my mom's dad, my last grandparent. All I know about his life are the same old anecdotes I've heard like a thousand times. Stories of him growing up on some family ranch in Wyoming, riding horses, hunting birds, being a cowboy, all that, fine, whatever. But I need to know more. What was really going on? So I ask him, Grandfather, why did our family come out west? This is not where we came from. How did we get that land that the ranch was on? He says his father, my great-grandfather, brought the family out from Missouri and settled the ranch as a homestead, a free land grant from the government. Homestead? The ranch was a homestead? A free land grant? But who lived on that land before our family? He says, it was empty. Empty. Empty? <laughs> that land wasn't empty. It was emptied. <laughs> that ignorance holds me. No one ever told me this side of the story. All I heard was the guns and the glory. How the ranch was one with wave exploring. Now I'm stumbling as my image of the truth is crumbling. Feeling dumb and then feeling angry. When I scream, make the sound of a rifle banging. He's claiming this land was empty. I can see the mentality is tempting. It's easy to justify the crazy violence, the acts of insanity. The kill and steal, you must deny. Your own soul and your victim's humanity. But I plan to read and learn the real deal. Understandably, I still feel. Can I live a life of freedom and be lied to? But still the sickness of the death lives on inside you. It's time to go back and look. Who wrote my history book? Who took the land away from the people who spanned the plains? Who were these families? How did they live? How did they die? Who came in the white history? Why did they lie? I'm confused about what to do. How I should move. It's hard to tell what's true. There's so much I don't know. So much is new. Am I prepared for the changes of character in Native America? A lie and a truth, but the truth is scarier. My fear is a barrier. Ignorance holds me. You never told me this side of the story. All I heard was the guns and the glory. How the ranch was there for your exploring. <sighs> but I never said that to him. I never called them on it. It's just so personal. It's so painful. He wouldn't understand where I'm coming from. Wouldn't get the fact that I'm not trying to hurt him. I mean, maybe he'd hear some of it. Or at least respect that I have my own opinions. But after everything he's been through, in his 88 years of life on the planet, to have his own grandson attack him in his way of life, which is how he would hear it. It would really hurt him and our relationship. I love my grandfather. I love him so much. But we are so different. He's from a totally different generation, a different world. Sometimes... Some of the things he says, I mean, he's conservative. <laughs> and he's racist. And it's complicated. My grandfather was just a child when his father got that land. He did what he was taught to do. He listened to the Lone Ranger on the radio and then 
named his favorite horse Tonto. He went hunting with his friends and shot eagles with bows and arrows. He didn't know about the Lakota, and he doesn't want to know now. But <laughs> how is anything ever going to change if we're too scared to challenge our elders? I mean, I've got to say what I believe. It's the right thing to do, regardless of how he takes it. But what good would that do, really? I can't change his mind. He's not trying to change his worldview. And I don't want to ruin our relationship. He's my grandfather. The only one I have left. Free land? Oh. Empty? Uh huh. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, grandfather. My grandfather didn't have the answers to all my questions, but I needed to know everything I could about my family history, about the ranch, the Homestead Act. I asked my mom to pull out all the old black and white family photo albums. As I was going through one, I found a black and white picture of my grandfather as a boy. He clutches a bow and arrow, a 10-year-old bird hunter on the edge of a field on the family ranch in Wyoming. 160 acres of free land. A gift from the government in 1918, a homestead in America. 290 million acres, 10% of the United States, stolen from Native Americans and given to white people for free. First, the army invaded with firearms and fire water, burning death across the plains, followed by waves of white settlers crashing across the continent to civilize the newly claimed country, pushing the border of white territory west with the God-given right to manifest destiny. My grandfather, an ignorant but direct benefactor of monumental genocide. When I look at the picture of my grandfather, I see in three years my family learned to claim the land with title in hand. When I look at the black and white picture of my grandfather, I see the image that's visible. But for the first time, I also see the legacy that's buried out of sight. My family's roots and deep within the blood-stained soil of American history. And then I realize my grandfather hunted birds and rabbits on the very same land the U.S. Army hunted Native American men, women, and children.
one night I woke up shivering in a cold sweat. Oh, whew, crazy nightmare. I dreamed I was being chased across the plains by soldiers who looked like me. The questions were haunting me. Who lived on that land? What happened to them? I needed to know, so I kept digging. I figured out the ranch was in Johnson County, Wyoming. So I called up the county records people and asked them to do a search for any homestead land patents with my great-grandfather's name. Two and a half weeks later, I pull a large manila envelope out of my mailbox, tear it open, and take out a copy of the original homestead land patent my great-grandfather filed to get the ranch. <sighs> Trip out! <sighs> it's like the original document. <sighs> this little piece of paper holds so much history. <sighs> the patent had the exact coordinates of the ranch. So I busted out a map, did some quick calculations, and figured out it was just southwest of KC, Wyoming, in the heart of the plains. I looked again and realized that was less than 100 miles from the Black Hills. Lots of tribes lived in that area. The Arapaho, Northern Cheyenne, the Lakota. Now that I had the exact location, I could search for events, dates, and people. I jumped online plugged into some search engines. Oh, snaps. There was all kinds of information. Not only was this land not empty, but there were hell of battles all over the plains. It says here, in 1876, two years after General Custer discovered gold in the Black Hills, the tribes formed an alliance and fought against the whites' invasion to defend their land. And they defeated the army in the Battle of the Little Bighorn. And then I found it. Within 10 miles of my family's ranch is a national historic site. Dull Knife Battlefield. This is it. This is what happened on that land. The story no one ever told me. Tall bull. Walking whirlwind. Hawks visit. Burns red. Four spirits. Walking calf. Crow necklace. And all those whose names were lost or forgotten, who died fighting for their freedom against the United States Army in the Battle of Chief Dole Knife, November 25th, 1876. Rest in peace. From the darkest depths of night comes a hint of light, shivering through snow in a world of winter white. Just before dawn when a day is born And pat a river country in the little big horns If you listen close, you can hear it in the wind The whisper of spirits, the distant cries of men Come with me to the better end of life At the clandestine campgrounds of Chief Dome Knife Nestled in a valley of sage and evergreen trees Herds of horses, fire pits and teepees Families sleep and the sun begins to rise The morning quiet is murdered in deafening surprise Storming, thunder of hooves and battle cries War songs echo as the first bullet flies You are soldiers riding out of hiding guns blasting Attacking the Cheyenne village in fast action Total chaos, the tribe awakes and the warrior shaken Stumble from the hippies naked With ammo in one hand Rifle and the other people running up ravines Behind the rocks to take cover A young girl runs to the hills into the sudden thud of a bullet ripping through her chest spills her blood. She falls in the mud, screams in agony and torture. The last thing she sees, a horse galloping towards her. A battling warrior charging for the soldier who shot her. Cause the young girl was his daughter. The father aims his rifle. Just as the bullet tears through his torso. 
It feels his life go. He silently slips from his horse slow. The slaughter of war knows no remorseful. The troops hunt men, women, and children. The body stinks with the stench of killing, killing, killing. But, 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 it might cost the free land. But, 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 can you imagine the cost of free land? But, be bit free, free, be bit free, free, live it, land, land, live it, land, land, live it, land, land. As the morning sunlight is shattered by the gunfight, Chief Belmont's men defend their troops. They show that the troops are General McKenzie. Purple screaming frantic through the frenzy. Through the woods, past the river, survivors run for their lives. While the army burns the village in the winter, surprise. With surprise in the side, the soldiers ride to prevail. Forced to try to flee deep inside the wilderness trails. Tonight, the temperature plummets to 30 below. They huddle in the snow, hungry, dirty, and cold. The thoughts biting their bodies, hurting the old men and women. They kill some ponies, put their hands and feet in them. Then in the night, 11 babies freeze to death. 11 babies. 11 babies freeze to death. In the arms of their mothers, with no food, no shelter, no covers, they suffer. The Cheyenne walk and walk through the mountain range. Every step in pain with the ghosts of the slain. The icy storms makes it hard to stay on track as many die from the cold as in the army's attack. But a desperate few by sheer force navigate their course through the winter trails to the camp of Crazy Horse. Their arrival draws on inner travel, help of the Lakota to support their survival. The last of the tribe struggle to stay alive. With no surprise, they have to make a compromise. The spring they surrender at Robertson Ford, blood on the white man's hands, and the Indian wars. If you listen close, you can hear it in the wind. The whispers of spirit, the distant cries of men. If that battle hadn't happened, and the Cheyenne weren't kicked off their land, my family would have never gotten that ranch. And then my grandfather's life would have been totally different. And then so would have mine. It's so crazy how a single event in history can completely change the course of our lives. But it's not like I think about that all the time. I mean, who wants to think about how their family benefited from something so horrific. The battle, it's so intense. I don't think I can ever think of the ranch in the same way again. I need to go there, be on that land, find the ranch and the battlefield, see for myself where my grandfather grew up, find my roots. Thank you. Thank you very much. So like I said, um, this is an excerpt, right? So we're stopping in the middle, and it's a particularly intense place to stop. So what I want to do is give you all just a minute or two to take a breath and reflect. So um, turn to a neighbor. And I want you to answer the following questions, just two or three minutes. How are you feeling? What are you thinking about? And um, anything that stood out for you from that excerpt. Okay, I'll let you know in about two or three minutes, and we'll come on back and keep, the, keep it going. But go ahead and turn to your neighbor, talk for just a second.
All right, go ahead and wrap up your conversations. I know that's too short, but there'll be more time later. Thank your partners for sharing and listening. And bring your attention right back here. <clears throat> Thank you very much. All right. So when I learned about that battle and the fact that it was on the same land that my family got for free from the government, it brought up a lot of really intense feelings, if, as you can imagine, you know, um, incredible sadness, just incredible sadness, and anger, and guilt, and, you know, all kinds of things, right? And, um, you know, it's been important for me to work through a lot of that. But one of the things that uh, became very clear to me was uh, a relationship between me and the Cheyenne. And you know, like most people in this country, at some point during my 16 years of formal education, I learned that a long time ago, Native Americans lived on this land, and then, you know, Europeans came, and bad things happened to them, but that's all over now, and it's very abstract, and it's very big, and it's very far away, right? But all of a sudden, learning this particular story, the specifics that my family got this specific piece of land in a specific place that was taken away from a specific people made it so much more real and so much more important. Earlier in the show, I don't have time to share it with you this afternoon, but I play myself in high school in a U.S. history class learning about the homestead. It's standard curriculum for every, you know, sophomore or junior in the country. We all learn it, kind of. But when I was in high school, I was so much more interested in talking to the girl next to me <laughs> than I was in following the lesson for a couple of different reasons. First, pedagogy. You know, it's like, read the chapter and answer the study questions. That, you know what I'm saying? It's like boring. It really, truly is very boring. Um, and if you've ever read Lies My Teacher Told Me by James Lowen, you have an understanding of what I'm talking about. The other reason is that the connections are not made. If I had known in my junior year of high school that my grandfather had grown up on a homestead, I probably would have listened a little bit differently. But my family, we only talked about it as the ranch, right? Sometimes you'll notice in family histories and family storytellings, people seem to sometimes omit some of the more complicated details or the less savory stories or anecdotes, right? There's a polishing that happens. So my family, we only talked about the ranch. And I never knew the political context for the ranch. If I had known that it was a homestead and then I was sitting in class learning about homesteads, and this is my grandfather, it's my mom's dad, right? This is the connection. I would have listened a little bit differently. So part of the things I want to, conversation I want to have is to think about how are we learning and teaching our young people history and what needs to change, right? The other thing that became very clear to me was that it was an incredible benefit for my family to get a large section of free land. My great-grandfather had a ranch, and it was, it was like a, a step up, right, in society. My, that f my family didn't have that much money. So getting this economic opportunity helped me. And that even today, living on the land that I live, which is still stolen Native American land, it's an incredible privilege to live on this land. This is beautiful land all over the country. I get to travel around and talk to students and perform at schools. It's a beautiful place to live. And it's a privilege to live here. And it's not unconnected from the genocide. So looking at this dynamic of how my family benefited from someone else's suffering and someone else's genocide is not an easy or fun thing to look at. I just want to be clear about that. But it's the truth. 
and the truth is important. And this history has completely shaped the world that we live in, as I'm going to talk about in, in a few minutes. So um, if we are concerned with the truth, if we are concerned with justice and equality in our society, it's important for us to go to these places as challenging, as ugly as they may be. Y'all still with me? Okay. So my family benefited, right, from this process. And it wasn't just my family. In 1862, the United States government passed the Homestead Act. Its main mechanism was designed to take land that had been stolen from Native Americans and distribute it to white families across the country. That was the point. It gave 160 acres of free land. Does anybody know how big this campus is? Anybody? Okay. That's all right. Look it up. <laughs> Compare it, yeah? 2,000 acres. Okay. So that's big. That's a big campus. Um, so 160 goes into that, I don't know, help me out, 12 times? 12, 13 times? So imagine this campus divided into 12 or 13 families, and it's all your land for free. Right? That's 160 acres. 12 families, they get the entire Iowa State University campus. It's a big piece of land, right? All in all, 270 million acres, or 10% of the United States, was homesteaded at one point. The act was on the books for about um, 114 years. So many, 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 many families got to participate in this. And they've done studies that show that one in, white, one in three white folks today have at least one ancestor, like my grandfather, like I do, who homesteaded. Okay? So, you know, I don't know how many white folks are in this room, but chances are, statistically speaking, at least one in three of us have family who have been directly connected by this. Widespread. That's a big number. It's a big impact. Um, this was not really available to African Americans. Out of the 1.6 million claims, only 4,000 African Americans were actually able to homestead. Okay, so 4,000 out of 1.6. Through institutional racism, discrimination, the poverty that came out of slavery, black folks weren't in a position to be able to take advantage of this opportunity. Similarly, white women, although there are a few stories of women homesteaders, they are the, the very, very exception. The vast majority of people who got free land from this institutional federal legislation were white men. Talk about affirmative action. Right? So, um, this is the picture of the Homestead Act. This is the country. You know, we understand that 500 years ago, Native Americans had control and used all of the country, right? That would be 100%. Over the period of, of that colonization process, 98% of the land base was stolen. That number is so staggering that, you know, I throw it out there, but, I, you know, 98%, like that's hard to really actually wrap your head around and feel what that means, right? But 98% of the land was stolen, and 98% of the population was killed. Disease had a major role, right? But direct violence, murder, and genocide also had a major role, right? Forced relocation, smallpox, blankets, war, et cetera, et cetera. So over a couple hundred years, this has happened. You see, you know, in the corner, um, it's all green, which is native land over here. Oh, no, opposite, excuse me. In this corner, it's all native land. In that corner, it's all um, today, right? This is um, current reservations, the red areas. Our current reservations right now, 2% of the land. It's a big deal. Um, if you think about who owns the land today, this is the map, right? 97% of privately held agricultural land is owned by white people. 97% of privately held agricultural land is owned by white people. The federal government has about 
of the land. States have about 9%. White families make up about 60% of homeowners, individual homeowners, right? So if you looked up today in 2010, who owns the land in this country? The vast majority of people are white people. This is not an accident. It all went back to the 1860s. African Americans were not allowed to own property at that time for the most part, and many times the property that they did held was taken away from them. Native Americans were systematically kicked off their property, right? Asian Americans on the, on the West Coast were not allowed to own property. There were explicit laws on the books that kept them from owning property. And we understand that land is the basis of your economy, right? If you want to grow things, you need land. If you want to make things, you need land. So the connection between land and political and economic empowerment is really clear. And this is the world that we live in today, 2010. Looks like this. Yeah? Y'all still with me? Okay. This question is for you. How is your family stories, no matter who you are, been shaped by this history of land theft and genocide against Native Americans? How have your family stories and your lives been shaped by the legacy and the history of this place? I'll let you all percolate on that and we'll keep it moving. So, you know, it's important for me um, to be clear, right? Like this, mostly this all happened in the past. And I can't undo that history, right? Until someone comes up with, um, what was it, DeLorean in Back to the Future? Yeah? <laughs> Y'all know what I'm talking about? Until someone comes up with that time machine, we cannot go back and change what happened in the past, right? And I am not taking responsibility for something that other people did, right? I can't take responsibility even just for what my grandfather did. That's not me. I am only in control of my own actions, right? So we can't undo the past. We can't change it. I'm not taking responsibility for it or asking anybody else to. But we can think about how it is affecting our lives in the world that we live in today and then take responsibility for our actions, the way we're perpetuating this process or challenging it and changing it, right? So, you know... I had to work through, sometimes I was feeling really guilty, all kinds of stuff. And I was like, no, I have to be clear about it. I am only responsible in charge of me and my life. That's enough, let me tell you. <laughs> okay? I can't take all this on, but I need to know about it. And I need to understand how it shapes my life, right? Um, because ultimately, all this is only important in as much as it informs the question of what do we do now, right? We have a present and a future to take care of. Right? So that's where it goes. And on that note, I want to share with you the next excerpt of Freelance. Y'all okay with that? Yeah. Okay. So what happened was I actually did go out to Wyoming. I'm going to cover over the parts that I'm skipping in the play so you, under, you can follow along, right? Um, I went out to Wyoming with my mother and my grandfather. We found the ranch. We found the battlefield. I met the people who lived there, met Northern Cheyenne folks. I had a really profound experience. Um, and if you want to see it, you'll just have to um, check out the whole show next time you have an opportunity to. Um, I am releasing the DVD of the show next month. It will be available on my website. So if you want to fill in that blank, you can check it out for yourself. Um, that's ariellucky.com in case you were wondering. <laughs> um, so um, I have this whole profound experience in Wyoming, learning the history of the land. And then I get back to Oakland, right, California. Where I, where I was born and have lived all of my life. And this next section begins there. Ready? All right. I now know the history of the ranch. And that land in Wyoming? But what went down here in Oakland? Who lived on this land? What happened to them? I've lived here my entire life, gone through 16 years of formal education. 
and still don't know jack about the indigenous people of this land. Like, what's up with a lonely park? Or a shell mound street? There's all these references to Native Americans, but they're so easy to not pay attention to, just fading into the background. But something changed back there in Wyoming. A door was opened that I can't close. I can't pretend I don't know what I know. And I need to find out what happened here in my hometown. I walk from my house in Oakland four blocks to the border of Emeryville through the brand new gentrification condominiums past the train tracks over to the Bay Street Mall. At the intersection of Shell Mound Street and Ohlone Way, I stop and look around. 360 degrees of development, all built in the last 10 years. It all has that new plasticky kind of feel, like it's a Disneyland set or something. 250,000 cars drive by this spot on Interstate 80 every single day. I've driven through here thousands of times. But I've never stopped to really look, to really see the land below the city. What's down there? Down there. Jibba, jibba down, jibba down, down, jibba down, down, like a DJ scratching archival records. I dig in crates of the past. Searching for the perfect beat. Like geologists read rocks to tell time in reverse, this land holds history carved in its flesh, stories submerged in its structure. Starting at the surface and digging down into the unknown history of my homeland. Digging down, digging down, jibba jibba the jibba the digging down. Who? Ha! 2010. I stand on this land, this shopping mall owned and operated by Madison Marquette. Easy to forget where I am in the glittering glass of American gluttony. Shiny and new and on sale, 400,000 square feet of retail. Banana Republic, Bank of America, Bells and Nova, Victoria's Secret, Old Navy, H&M and The Gap, 264 apartments, 82 townhouses, 16 movie screens, 2,000 parking spaces. Adjacent Ikea. Thick slab of pavement over earth packed hard and heavy, dead in the screaming silence of the past. Digging down. Hoo! Ha! Down beneath sidewalk and streets, mall construction disturbs buried bodies. A lonely ancestors sleep for hundreds of years, wake up to the sound of blaring bulldozers, scraping their souls into steel boxes. Some bones so toxic they feel like rubber. So drunk off chemical cocktails they're handled and disposed of as toxic waste. Others buried in unmarked mass graves, hundreds removed from their resting place to create space for the foundation of the new mall. Emeryville City Council calls desecrated cemetery progress. And Stonewall's local Alonian community members who demand respect for the dead. Corporate officials play their game to win, offer losers a fake 50-foot shell mound filled with whitewashed history, adding insult to injury, saying nothing about lonely burials, nothing about the hundreds of bodies already removed nor the thousands that remain, nothing about the vibrant lonely community alive today, digging down. Who? Ha! 1981. Amidst rusty industry and economic decline, this land's a fit the sign federal designation as a brownfield. Soil fully saturated with hydrogen, sulfide, arsenic, lead, DDT residuals, and petroleum hydrocarbons. The ground bubbles with acid as volatile heavy metals seep into buried bones, bleed into Timiskau Creek, run red into the bay. Muddy water poisoned before I was born, digging down. Boom! 1924, this land is sold to Sherman Williams Paint Factory. Their paint cover the earth logo depicts a paint bucket pouring blood red paint over blue green globe, suffocating the planet as 
businessmen drive steam shovels, crying and ripping the largest shell mound down to ground level. Archaeologist notes 692 bodies found and haphazardly destroyed. Arrowheads, knives, spearheads, mortars, pestles, ceremonial pipes, all devoured by hungry metal mouths crunching through hundreds of years of history. Shell mound material calcium rich from shells and bones used to pave Oakland Berkeley streets, College Avenue, Dwight Way, Interstate 80. White people paved their modern roads with bones of baloney ancestors, paving the roads with bones, walking on a people's history without regard, digging down. Who? Ha! 1876. The year Custer was killed and blood rained down on the Dull Knife Battlefield, an entrepreneur establishes an amusement park, Shell Mound Park, with horse track, carousel, train station, bowling alley, shooting range, restaurants, bars, and a dance pavilion placed directly on top of the Shell Mound. Wealthy white people flock from big city across the bay to dance polkas, Irish jigs, and fast waltzes on the graves of baloney men, women, and children. Literally dancing on their graves, drunk and dancing until prohibition slows the stream of amusement seekers to a lonely trickle. A lonely land littered with broken beer bottles and empty bullet shells digging down. Hoo! Ha! 1850. The story expands. Shell Mound land colonized into California. Golden State feeding, gold rush seething with 300,000 49ers fiending gold, rushing mine, rivers bleeding gold. Immigrant greed speeds native genocide. Disease and murder explode like gunpowder as state leaders pay white militias $1 million to hunt for native scalps. $5 a head. Over 4,000 children kidnapped and sold into legalized slavery while the shell mound screams in silence, digging down. Who? Ha! 1769. The land passes hands from U.S. to Mexico, from Mexico to Spain, digging down. Who? Ha! 1769. Father Junipero Serra stabs the earth with Spanish flagpole. European invaders establish mission system slavery for a lonely manual labor. Kidnap and convert children to save their souls from a Christian devil. A lonely backs broken by guns and Bibles. Survival wrung like water from stone. A people's home gutted and burned, blood, bleeding bloody and bruised bodies, fatal diseases surge in waves of widespread death. Death, death, down. Down, down in this hole. I've been digging for so long. I'm tired and cold. My body aches with the pressure. My hands are blistered and bloody. It's so hard to open my eyes. This truth is so ugly. So many layers of pain. My heart's numb. Stunned by the reality of what we've become. Our humanity lost in this culture of violence. While the status quo is entrenched in sickening silence, this is my home. But nobody told me about the history of genocide against the Ohlone, about the toxic waste sites or the dead ecosystem. I was searching for my roots because my ignorance was prison, but this knowledge is so hard to bear. Fellow in my world's built on suffering and nobody cares and what can I do? I'm just one person and I'm not sure that I have the strength to deal with this hurt. My heart is breaking to see my home stripped naked. They destroyed and violated everything I hold sacred. And my life is implicated. Who am I to live here? Just another white man who profits from oppression severe? I don't know what to do. It's such a deep contradiction. I can feel the past meet me heating up with the friction. But I can't ignore the voices that's been calling. The choices that I'm making. And the work I got involved in. Falling on my hands and knees. Digging in the dirt. Desperate for a way to heal this legacy's hurt. This history's so heavy. Like bones of lead. My heart is broken open. That's why his poem's red. <sighs> Look, here I am on this land. I'm just a man, but my hand has been dug here. I call my home where I live. I find love here. Yet this 
Earth is stained, gravestones and concrete. Is it worth the pain? I dig back in time and search for names, but I can't reverse the gains of my family, the hurts and the blames, the curse and the shame. I thirst for change from the plains to the coastal range, from Cartel Pro to AIM. Cowboys and Indians, war games, it's more the same. The horror remains. From Wyoming to West Oakland to Iraq, soldiers ordered to bang. You can't be neutral on a moving train. Nothing but full accountability. Injustice pursued the pain. My life, blood, bone, flesh, won the West. Colonial conquest, destiny manifest. The U.S. Army pressed and mounted war. How many innocent people murdered and unaccounted for? How many known dead? So my family could homestead. My history is bleeding. That's why this poem's read. Are you prepared for the changes of character? Do you claim area in Native America? My life in white skin, privilege. My great granddaddy's prophet was wrong. And mine still is my village. Built on haunted ground where they killed kids. Break the women, burn the buildings and pillage. How many known dead? So my family could homestead. My history is burning. That's why this poem's read. Down. Down, 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 <laughs> digging down deeper into the dark. When the Christian calendar does not mark the year, when seasons cycle with acorn harvest and animal migration, a time when birds darken the sky with their wings. Grizzly bears and antelopes roam through rolling hills and redwoods. Sea otters swim in the crystal blue bay, encircled by the shell mound. For thousands of years, the Ohlone have called this place home, where the complex ecology of land and water brings an abundance of food. Shellfish, a central staple for the Ohlone. Oysters, crabs, gooseneck barnacles, clams, abalone. Gathered in wicker baskets, cleaned and cooked and eaten. Shells discarded on the ground accumulate over time into mounds. Hundreds of years of shells, layers of life and death. The Ohlone buried their dead here, bodies covered in red ochre, buried with precious possessions, abalone ornaments, elk bone whistles, bundles of raptor talons, buried in fetal position next to their families, shell mound cemeteries, sacred sites. This shell mound was the biggest around the bay. Over 65 feet tall, 350 feet diameter, bigger than a city block. Built by generations of shells, bones, and bodies, earth and rock and plants packed together like puzzle pieces. While the people collect acorns in the autumn and hunt deer in the spring, Weave baskets of willow and fern root. Sweat ceremonies in Timiskals and sing to the spirits of the trees. Family clans and community councils weave the web of relations. A civilization too subtle for European eyes. Called burden, savage, diggers who don't know God.
or here, at the bottom of this hole, I think I can finally see how the layers of dirt in our eyes blind us. How genocide becomes normalized and the people become lost and the truth forgotten. Their descendants walk among us. Their names secret our landscape. A street, a park, a dusty plaque on the wall. We deny their presence and exploit their memory as we live upon their land. But if you listen close, you can hear it in the wind, the whispers of spirit, the echoes from within. Only fragments of Ohlone culture have survived the genocide. From the screaming silence comes a song, an old Ohlone song from ancient times. All that is known, this single line. Dancing on the brink of the world. Thank you. Thank you very much. So that's what I found out, right? As an adult, when I had to go back on my own, and learn the history of that land. They never taught me that in school. Pretty much any of that. So that brings us to an interesting question. Iowa. Here we are, right? Here we are in Iowa. So I had to go through that process, learn the history of my homeland. I thought I would share just a few little pieces of information that I learned about the history of Iowa. This is a map of natives in Iowa. The thing about maps, right, is that folks were nomadic, you know, in, in certain areas. So this isn't completely accurate. It's just a snapshot. It's just an idea, right? But some of the main folks were the Iowas. I think I've heard that before somewhere, that name. Um, the Sauk and the Miswaki, which also are called the Fox. Miswaki and Fox, same thing. Um, the Dakota and the Ho-Chunk, right? These are some of the folks that live in this, name, in, in, in this area. Y'all with me? Okay, just a little bit. This is Iowa. That's the chief um, from the Iowa days. They lived here. They did all kinds of interesting things. Learn about them. The Miswaki, they have um, some land over by Tama, right? But people of the Red Earth. And, um, and there they are, some of the Miswaki, right? Again, this is an uh, this is, uh, institution of higher education. Learn about it. Right? First contact with Native Americans, with Europeans here, happened in the 1600s. It was primarily French, a little bit of English, and it was all about the fur trade. Because in Europe, in the 1600s, wealthy women liked hats made out of fur. Okay? So traders came over here to kill lots of animals, to get the fur, to send it back to Europe to make hats to sell to wealthy women. Y'all with me? So that's what it was all about. And for a long time, um, there were relatively peaceful relationships because the Native American folks were like happy to go and hunt and they would trade for metal or whatever else um, they wanted from the French and English traders. And there was a, like several, a couple hundred years of pretty peaceful trade and coexistence in this area. Then the Louisiana Purchase happened in 1803. Now it's a funny thing because the only thing that um, the United States purchased was New Orleans, a very small part of land. Th the whole thing that you normally think about was actually uh, lived in and owned by Native Americans at the time. And uh, the French didn't have the right to sell that land. And the United States government at that time recognized the sovereignty and tribal ownership of that land um, of all the Native folks. So that's interesting. I, uh, Louisiana Purchase, which Iowa was a part of. Well, once the furs ran out, because you kill all the beaver every day, go kill some more beaver, go kill some more beaver, all the beaver die. No more beavers. Sad. Um, and, you know, st we start to understand a little bit of the connections between environmental issues and degradation and the colonization process, right? Well, the next thing that Europeans wanted was the land. And there were two primary tools that they used to get that land. The first being guns. That's pretty obvious, right? Um, and the second were treaties. 
there were 371 treaties signed by the United States government with various Native American groups, and they broke every single one of them. It is amazing the lack of integrity that this country has um, in historically, right? Absolutely mind-boggling. A hundred percent of the treaties. So, you know, and maybe some of the people, I imagine some of the people who are on the, on the white European-American side who are signing those treaties believed that they would be kept, right? Um, so it's not, it wasn't all necessarily malicious. And yet, as a society, as a government, every single one of those treaties were broken. So the process would go like this. Hey, Native Americans, we want some of your land. Let's make a treaty. Okay, you go over here. We'll take this land. Great, here's our treaty. We're good. Five, ten years go by. Okay, hey, let's make a new treaty. Old treaty's old. We want a little bit more of your land. You go over there, and we'll, we'll take more of this land. Okay, cool, two, three minutes. Um, okay, hey, Native Americans, you know what I'm saying? And it literally went by that, treaty by treaty, broken treaty by broken treaty, from the east to the west, all the way across this area. It's crazy. Well, uh, you know, Native Americans resisted that, right? They were not super happy on about this, for the most part. Um, this is the Black Hawk War. That is Chief Black Hawk. Um, he is a Sauk chief. And um, this took place just on the Iowa border, on the Mississippi, between Iowa and Illinois, very close to here. In 1832, he did not want to live, leave his village. Can you imagine that? He grew up there his whole life. He had a deep connection to the land, and he didn't want to leave. So he started organizing, and they fought back. They fought this war. Um, it ended at the Bad Axe Massacre. Bad news um, for the Sauk and, and uh, Mis Miswaki folks, where um, white militia killed hundreds of Native um, of their group. It was like a band of like 800 people, and um, you know, just killed. Uh, many women, children, elders, and, and warriors um, so badly that um, basically that ended the war, right? It was one of those like single battles and the people got wiped out. So in the treaty that the United States government, the new treaty that the United States government made with the Sauk and Miswaki, um, they wanted even more land. Originally, they just wanted them on the west side of the Mississippi, right? We all know that Mississippi runs north-south. And, the, and for in the early 1800s, it was all about getting all the Native Americans who were on the east side over to the west side. But then that wasn't enough. So then they crossed the Mississippi into eastern Iowa, came out of this treaty in 1982. Then there was a rapid influx of white settlers. It's good land, y'all, right? It's like farmland, all kinds of opportunities out here. Um, these are some white settlers. They surged into Iowa, and they literally forced the Sauk and Wiskaki to move over and over again um, during the 30s and 40s um, of the 1800s. It was like, okay, move a little farther west and a little farther west and a little farther west until they moved to Nebraska and Kansas, um, Oklahoma, completely out of the state in general, right? So this is the history of the land that we live in. In 1856, the United States government passed the Iowa Land Bill. Um, giving a bunch of land recently taken from the Sauk and, and Miswaki, thank you, um, and gave it to the state of Iowa with the expressed purpose of giving that land to the railroad companies, right? This is the Transcontinental Railroad. Wouldn't it be cool if you could get on a plane, uh, train in New York and go to San Francisco? That's cool, right? Let's build that and let's take all this land in order to do that. So what happened was the railroad companies were private corporations owned by wealthy white businessmen, okay? So the federal government took this land from the Native American folks, gave it to the state. The state gave it to these private corporations. The corporations built the railroad and made a lot of money. Now, I was thinking about it last night as I was putting this together. I imagine there are direct descendants of those wealthy businessmen still alive today in, in Iowa, Right? We also understand that there's probably, I'm sure, there's direct descendants of the Wis Miswaki and the Sauk folks also alive in Iowa. I wonder how they're doing. And what, what difference in economic and political opportunities they have. Being three or four generations out of this specific deal, 1856. 
The government took this land from them and gave it to them. Well, now there's great-grandchildren, but they're still here. How are they doing? And how does this affect the, our political organizing, the way that we understand the communities that we live in? You following me? Awesome. I'm going a little faster than I would like to because we're running out of time. I want to share this information with you. Okay, moving forward. Whoa, Ames, what's up? <laughs> Hi. Ames was founded a few years later in 1864, right? Eight years after that little uh, railroad deal. And interestingly enough, it was founded as a train station stop. Okay, there's Ames. There he is, Mr. Ames, Oaks Ames, okay? He was a Massachusetts congressman, and he was a businessman, and he owned a lot of Union Pacific. He was a big player, right? He's like the CEOs of, you know, whatever, Bechtel or, you know, Chevron today, right? He's a player, right? Well, um, Ames was named after him. And uh, he was very involved in getting the railroad to come through here. And um, apparently there was this very um, big scandal where um, he was giving stock from his private company to other congressmen so that they would pass legislation favorable to the company, right? This whole scandal came, it actually came out public and Congress censored him and um, threatened to kick him off and all this stuff, right? So, uh, and then the city of Ames was founded as a train station stop. So this is like great grandfather of Ames. Um, and uh, I don't know, maybe it's just a picture, but he doesn't look like a nice guy. <laughs> <you> <laughs> Um, and we know that he was, uh, he was uh, you know, manipulating our democratic system to make more money. And we also know that he was given a lot of free land from the state of Iowa that they got from the federal government that they stole from the Sauk and Meskwaki people. Y'all following me here? Yeah. Woo! History is crazy, right? And why are in high school classes this interesting? Okay. <laughs> Iowa State Land Grant University in 1862. Does anybody remember that year? 1862 was the year that they passed the Homestead Act. Well, the government was like, hey, we got hell of land. We got to give it out to everybody. So they also passed the Morrill Act, which granted federal land to states to create schools. Look at that. Because we need railroads. Wouldn't it be cool if we could go from New York to San Francisco on a railroad and we could stop and get educated along the way? So, Iowa State University became the first school in the country to accept land under the Morrill Act. Fascinating. Free land. Free land. Hmm. So, here we are. This is, I presume, this is where you live and work and study. This is the history of this land. What happened here? Was there a village on this land at one point? Was there a battle? A sacred site? A massacre? A cemetery? You tell me. What happened on this land? And how does that affect who we are today, what we're working on? How does that affect our understanding of race and ethnicity in 2010? So, first Europeans took the furs, right? Got to have those hats. Then we took the land, 98% of it. That's not enough. No, 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 no. Let's take their images, right? All over the country, high school, college, elementary school, professional, you know, athletic teams have been named after Native American. And if you can see... Um, there's some pretty ugly stereotypes here, right? The skin color, the big nose. Um, you have stoic to, you know, angry. You name it, right? There's been a movement over the last um, couple decades to change, and many schools on the high school level, college level, have changed their mascots. I was just, just up at um, University of Wisconsin La Crosse a couple weeks ago, and they were the Indians for a long, long, long time and they changed their mascot. I think this is a good idea, you know? But we still have the Washington Redskins and the Atlanta Braves, right? What does this mean that we're using these racist
stereotypes of, an, of another people for our mascot. If these were Sambo figures in blackface, would that be politically acceptable in this country? You know, to have the, you know, Seattle Sambos? I don't think so. So why is this okay? We also take their names, right? The state of Iowa, the state of Missouri, the state of Mississippi, the state of Dakota, all over the country. Place names, the names of parks and waterfalls, bridges, rivers, everything is named after Native American names. We took their land and took their names. Named the land after them, even though we kicked them off. It's crazy, right? When you really think about the implications of this on a spiritual level, let alone a political level, what is really going on in our society? Cars, you know, you name it, right? We've named uh, things after Native Americans. So, this is for Karen, right? We were talking about uh, Avatar last night, right? You know the similarities? Again, taking images, cultural images and icons from Native Americans, using it in pop culture. Who benefits from this? Who gets to decide what is used and what is not? And what does it mean? How does this impact Native American people? And then, Twilight. <laughs> Anybody seen Twilight or uh, New Moon? Yeah, right? So uh, the Quilu tribe is actually a real tribe in the state of Washington. For a long time, uh, you know, uh, they got their land stolen too. Rest assured, there were treaties and guns in Washington state as well. So for the last, you know, long generations, they've been living in a lot of poverty in rural, rural state of Washington. Well, all of a, all of a sudden, a white woman decides to come and write a story, and she takes a piece of their cultural heritage. They do have a story about wolves and their origin myth. Not werewolves, but wolves. She takes an element of their cultural heritage, distorts it fictionally, but still uses their name. And she releases a book and a movie and now, you know, any kind of product line and has made millions and millions of dollars, right? This is a big industry in the United States today. Go anywhere and a high school student will tell you all about Twilight. Well, what about the Quilu folks? For the most part, they've still been living in poverty and have not benefited economically from this process. In fact, um, one of the TV channels that were running stories about it started leading tours on their land, on their reservation, for tourists who wanted to get an authentic tour of the Indians, right? So what, how does this inform our work? How does this inform our discussions in higher education around race and ethnicity? How are we addressing these issues? And for me, one of the things that come up, you know, thinking about um, how I've benefited, right? My family has benefited from the genocide of Native Americans, not intentionally, but indirectly, but nevertheless benefited. So I think about, you know, what can I do in terms of balance, in terms of healing, restitution, what can I do to support Native Americans today in the issues that they're facing, right? Sacred site protection, appropriate mascots, environmental conservation, energy extraction, sovereignty and human rights. What are the issues that Native Americans are working on today, are struggling with today in their communities? And how can I, not necessarily out of a place of guilt or shame, but out of a sense of justice and equality and democracy, how can I support them and their leadership in making the changes that they are, they are working on? You follow me? I would pose that question to you as well. How can you be engaged in that process of building community with Native Americans across the country in the important issues that they're working on? So we are almost done. Just one more little question. Just a little, little question. How can we heal from the past? The big and ugly painful past. How can we heal from this past? Transform our present and create a better future.
I have two little boys in my life, four years old and, and eight months old. And it's all about them, right? I don't want them to live in that world, right? We got we to gotta stop this cycle. So on that note, I want to share one last little short segment of the show. It's at the very, very end. Um, and you can run that last track now, if you would. White Privilege Conference, I'm performing the entire Freelance show. It's um, just in uh, lacrosse. Come through. Little acts and big acts. There's so many things we can do, right? To make a difference. After all the bloodshed, generations of war. After all the broken treaties of lies and brute force, after 500 years of colonization, the broken backs and heart attacks have built this nation. We stand on stolen land with the past in our hearts and the future in our hands. Are we prepared for the changes of character, breaking the barriers in Native America? How can we carry the legacy and move forward as builders, teachers, artists, healers, warriors? I offer this prayer to reclaim our humanity in the name of my family. This is a testimony of one man's journey. This is a drop of water for a history burning. This is a prayer, a call to action, a confession for all of my people on both sides of oppression, for the generals, the soldiers, and the civilians, for the grandparents, the parents, and the children, for the Ohlone people in the Northern Cheyenne, for the people living in Wyoming and Oakland, for the kids on reservations and the kids in the burbs, for the kids in the ghettos and rich kids who can splurge, for the children of the slaves and the slave masters, for the victims of genocide, and it's been a factors for every single human being caught in the mix, faced with generations of problems to fix. I don't have the answers, probably neither do you, but if we look at it together, we'll get a better view, and if we ask the questions and dig for the truth, we might find the power that comes from our roots, and maybe, just maybe, maybe we can make this world less crazy, maybe, we can turn this thing around. Maybe we can stand together on common ground. Maybe we can raise our children to understand. We need a place of healing for the people in the land. Call it free land. Because the people are free. And the land is liberated from the chains of property. The people's liberated from the chains of poverty. And our souls are liberated from the chains of history. Life is a mystery. We do the best we can. Every day a chance to practice being better human. I don't have the answers. Probably neither do you. But if we look at it together, we'll get a better view. And if we ask the questions and dig for the truth, we might find the power that comes from our roots. And maybe, just maybe, maybe we can make this world less crazy. Maybe we can turn this thing around. Maybe we can stand together on common ground. Maybe we can raise our children to understand. We need a place of healing for the people and the land. Call it free land. Because the people are free. And the land is liberated from the chains of property. The people's liberated from the chains of poverty. And our souls are liberated from the chains of history. We're free. Got to be free. We're free. Got to be free. We're free. Got to be free. We're free. Got to get free. Oh, oh, oh. Hey, hey. very much. Thank you, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. <coughs> thank you so much. Just very quickly, I, I just want to say that um, I have books for sale that include some of the um, Freeland um, script and songs that, that you heard today. Um, and we're releasing a DVD of Freeland this spring. It's available on my website. And in the fall, we're going to be releasing a study guide for educators to be able to use the DVD and do lessons in your classroom. There's an email list um, if you want to sign up and stay informed about my work. And there's free stickers and business cards and other stuff. So come on by. Thank you so much. I will also be in um, uh, some room. Uh, yeah. Um, talking to whoever wants to come talk. So come see me. Thank you. I just want to say um, hurry to your next session. Uh, the students are there prepared and waiting for you.